Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show one of our most popular and most outspoken guests, Dr. Mark Faber. Mark is a very shrewd Swiss investment advisor. He is the editor of the Gloom, Boom, Doom Report and the director of Mark Faber LTD, which acts as an investment advisor and fund manager. Mark is also the author of several books, including The Great Money Illusion. To accompany this interview today, we've created an amazing bonus report that covers Mark's outstanding library of work. Our free report is available for everyone to download at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Mark. That's M-A-R-C. Mark, welcome to this show. How are you today? Well, fine. Thank you. And nice to see you. <laughs> but it's very cold here in Chiang Mai, in the north of Thailand. <laughs> yes, I want to start off right with mentioning <laughs> to everyone, tell them where you're at and what's going on, because you look like you're freezing. Well, uh, I'm not freezing yet, but it may happen later on at night. Okay. Uh, it's one o'clock in the morning now. We are located, Chiang Mai is in the north of Thailand, at essentially the early stages of the Himalayas and from here it goes essentially uh, higher and higher to the peak uh, Mount Everest and in neighboring Myanmar which people would never realize which used to be called Burma but in Myanmar the highest mountain is 6,000 meters so it's over 18,000 feet but people would not, because Myanmar stretches to the sea, so they would not uh, imagine that there would be such a high, such high mountains there. Now, you don't heat your homes there? Uh, there are no heatings in homes. I have uh, two blowers, but you know, my office is very large, it's five meters high. Uh, in the lower floor, and it goes up 25 meters. <laughs> so the heat goes up, doesn't <laughs> stay down. And then there is a draft from the drawer and from the windows, which because it's built essentially for hot seasons. So it's not built for cold. Well, it adds a whole lot of ambiance. To you. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> it's Christmas time. So. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And it looks like it. Now, Mark, let's start off the interview with global politics. Um, it's been said that once China and the United States reach a trade deal, whether it's a small preliminary one or the big one, that the dollar trade would unwind and many institutions and governments would begin to reduce their reserves of USD, perhaps causing a dollar surplus and a bear market. Up until now, the dollar has been the king of fiat currency. Do you really believe that there's a correlation between this particular trade deal and the unwinding of treasury holdings by China? I don't believe that there is a connection between the two. But I believe that uh, after a bull market in dollars, which we had essentially since 2015, I think that the dollar is on the high side, on the purchasing power parity, and uh, that the dollar will weaken regardless. Now, the question is, of course, it will weaken against what? <laughs> well, this year, surprisingly, it weakened 18% against the Ukraine Kremlin and 8% against the Russian ruble and 5% against the Thai baht. Now, maybe it weakened against uh, the Ukraine currency because both countries are about equally corrupt, but uh, it's still amazing that the country that is so controversial has had such a strong currency in 2019. Now, I believe the dollar will weaken. It's also weakened actually against the Canadian dollar this year and uh, against the British pound. The pound has rallied now almost 10% in six weeks from the low of 120. We're now at uh, over 131 against the US dollar. 
So the currency markets can be very volatile. The Latin American currencies are basically mostly down. Uh, the exception is maybe the Mexican peso, which had weakened before. So this year it's been stable against the US dollar. But we had just recently a massive devaluation in Argentina and say a 15% devaluation in Chile. So the currencies is a very tricky game. I believe the dollar will weaken, but then I'm asking myself, is the euro so much better? Is the British pound so much better? And, so forth? and my conclusion is, if you're really bearish about the US dollar, probably what you should own are precious metals. I think if the dollar really weakened, I think more and more investors uh, would opt for precious metals. I written uh, a month ago a report. If I had to make one investment for my uh, kind of fictitious, fictive uh, uncle, you know, he doesn't exist, but he was a man who only wanted to invest in something every t 10 years. What would you do? So I suggested I would buy platinum because platinum is very inexpensive compared to gold. Traditionally, platinum trades at the premium to gold, but now it trades at the large discount. That's very By the way, today, platinum was up 3%. <laughs> 3% in one day. Yeah. <laughs> So instead of gold or silver right now, which I thought you would go for silver because it's dropped so far and it's causing such a wide gap between gold, but you're mentioning platinum. And I'd like you to go into that a little bit for investors. Most people are aware of platinum, but please go ahead and explore that for us. Well, platinum is really a precious metals. It's actually rarer than gold. There's less platinum being mined every year than gold. There's less uh, above the surface platinum than gold and it's basically manufactured or produced by two countries South Africa and Russia and I think one of these countries may decide to squeeze the market at some point and we have to realize in commodity markets there's a lot of funny games going on there's a lot because the markets are not that large so big players or large companies like Rio Tinto, BHP, Glencore, uh, they can ex essentially squeeze the market. And Russia being the large, largest uh, producer of platinum, they could easily squeeze the market. So I think that for that reason, the, the silver market is a very big market. It would be difficult to squeeze it, although it's been done. Uh, Bunker Hunt uh, squeezed the silver market in the late 70s and then it peaked out in January 1980 and uh, the Commodities Trading Commission changed the rules about margins of silver and then the whole thing collapsed. <laughs> but he managed to squeeze the silver price from like $3 to $50. Single-handedly. Well, I met a man in uh, Dubai, uh, Mr. Ashraf. And this Mr. Ashraf, he was the largest gold and silver dealer in the Middle East. And I say dealer, but in essence, he was a smuggler. One of his brother was an, uh, like government officials in one of the valleys in, in uh, Pakistan. Like a land, like a warlord. I also met the brother then subsequently. He was always smoking a joint. <laughs> a nice person. <laughs> and this Mr. Ashraf, I, I went to see him a few times because at the time I was working for Drexel Burnham Lambert and Drexel was a large player in the commodity markets and in particular in the gold market. And According to this Mr. Ashraf, he had given the idea of squeezing the silver market to the Saudis, which I can believe because the Saudis 
don't know anything, didn't know anything about markets in those days. But this Mr. Ashraf gave them the idea and the Saudis then apparently because they had dealings with Bunker Hunt, which was an oil man from Texas, he gave the idea to Bunker Hunt. So they decided the three of them to squeeze the market. You know, Mark, it's amazing how precious metals can be manipulated by so few people. Just a couple of people getting together with the ability to do it up, down. It's just incredible to this day. Yes, but other commodities are much smaller. I mean, you know, it's easier to squeeze the coffee market or the cocoa market or the sugar market and so forth. And it happens all the time. But this market manipulation is, prevails everywhere. We have a lot of market manipulations also, I presume, in equities, where if you watch the market, frequently towards the close, there is huge buying of, you know, maybe it's program trading, maybe it's just the computers. They squeeze the market higher for, say, half an hour, and then they stop buying, and then the market drifts again. But it give, if they can squeeze the market higher towards the close, then the opening the next day tends to be higher as well. Yeah. And so I, I believe there's a lot of manipulation. And by the way, and by the way, <laughs> I think the Federal Reserve, you know, they have a, a crash a protection team that they intervene as well sometimes. Right. You know, when the market is very weak, that they step in to support the market. Yeah. And, you know, I think most people still imagine Wall Street as being like the movie, you know what I mean? Like a bunch of people um, doing their deals on the floor when, in fact, it's all run by a computer. So it's very easy now to do such things. Yes, I think, and also the institutions are very large, you know, if someone really goes in and buys 5,000 S&P contracts or 5,000 options on the S&P, then it can have a temporary impact. I'm stressing here temporary, because it's not a long-lasting impact, but it has the, say, I squeeze the market at the end of New York hours. In the last 10 minutes, the New York market closes up a little bit. Then if I went long during the trading session, say the Asian markets, if the New York market closes up, it's most likely that the Asian markets will open up a little bit. Some may open up a lot and some a little bit, but on a strong close in New York, it's unlikely that Asian markets would collapse. So someone can actually kind of manipulate markets to some extent. Wow. <laughs> now, Mark, I, I want to switch gears just a little bit. I want to ask you something about Japan and Europe and their central banks, because it appears that they're going to need to combat recession and slowdown occurrences within their jurisdictions. However, they've already implemented negative interest rates. So what, in your opinion, as far as tools do they have to go to when this does happen? Well, they can go, uh, if negative interest rates are half a percent, then they can go to one or two or three percent, theoretically. I don't think it helps at all, but this is a measure. Number two, and I want to introduce here a thought because when you think about it, the more money you print, uh, the more money becomes essentially free of charge, especially if interest rates are zero or below zero. So once you have this situation, the government programs become essentially free of charge. In other words, the government can finance health care for everybody. It could finance holidays <laughs> for everybody. <laughs> it could finance a bottle of whiskey for everybody. And so forth and so forth. Because at zero interest rates, there's no cost. And the Fed or the Bank of Japan, and they can print money and finance this all. So... Basically, 
this idea that the zero interest rates are good is not such a great idea because zero interest rates and money printing will lead to socialism. It's inevitable. And reverting to your question, uh, what can Japan and Europe do? The next station is to introduce fiscal measures. Uh, this has been proposed already a long time ago and all, also implemented to some extent under fiscal policies. You can send a check to every family of a thousand dollars and then they can spend it and that boosts economic activity. And at zero interest rates, there's no immediate, and I repeat, there's no immediate da damage to the economy because interest rates are at zero. You understand? Mm -hmm. So this is a measure they, I, I think it's almost certain that within the next 10 years, we'll have in Western democracies and Japan, full-fledged socialism and probably a totalitarian regime and that we will have basic incomes, you know, that people will be given money. But as a result of all these measures, uh, I would also imagine that the standards of living of everybody will go down. Because I've seen socialist countries and the standards of living were very low compared to the Western world, which had capitalistic policies. Mark, I want you to talk to everybody about this because you have a unique experience as opposed to most of our viewers and, of course, opposed to myself. I've grown up in the United States. I've never seen personally socialism. I know the ideas <coughs> and the ideals of it. But um, talk to us about how it happens, what happens at first, what's the experience of everyone, and then what does it turn into? And talk about timeline-wise. Well, socialism can develop under many different conditions, but usually it will emerge in, uh, in systems that have uh, great wealth inequality, you know, where the majority of people doesn't do well, and then you have a leader like either Stalin or Hitler or, you know, somebody else like Mao or Ho Chi Minh or Le Duan, and so forth, they come up and uh, then they overthrow the existing elite. In our case, in the U.S., it would be to overthrow essentially Washington. And uh, then... They introduce socialist policies where, and we're on the way because if you look at the interventions by the government into the economic activity, nowadays in the US is not as bad as in other countries, but in other countries, maybe 50% of the economy is government spending. In the US, it's over 40%. So, the government is, uh, has a bigger and bigger share of the economy. That's why once the government becomes larger and larger, the economy will not grow at the same pace as when the economy is small. So the economy slows down and then, you know, there's a, someone comes who is a, a populist who can talk well, whether it's Hitler or Stalin or... Uh, Mussolini. <laughs> so eventually, these populist governments, they come to power and they then run the economy. They will tell, uh, th under the worst circumstances, they will say, well, the, our automobile industry is bankrupt. We take it over. You, you understand? Or these companies, they are important for national security. We take them over. It's not that they will steal it away, but they will assume 
They will buy the shares or just take them over by force. And so production is then run by the government and the government will also tell the people what they can consume or what is available for consumption. So they'll produce a, like in China, blue dresses or uh, green dresses and nothing else. And so the consumer has very limited choices. And these systems have been the first time, because I was ski racing at the time, and we went to the, with the team to Eastern Europe, and these people were incredibly poor and had poor equipment compared to us in the Western world. And then I went in 1968, after my studies, I went to Czech, Czechoslovakia. It was still Czechoslovakia. It wasn't yet the Czech Republic and Slovakia. It was one country. And the day after I arrived, the Russians walked in because that was the Prague or spring, the summer of 1968. And so I had to go to the countryside with a girlfriend. I met her in a nightclub the night before. So anyway, but I've never seen such poor conditions in my life growing up in Switzerland. And I mean, I was really depressed after spending two days with that family. And, you know, I thought, how can this be that we in the West are relatively affluent and these people are so dirt poor? And then in 80, uh, 1978, 1980, I went for the first time to China. Same experience. There was nothing, you know. Shenzhen today has a larger population than Hong Kong. At that time, there was, it was agricultural fields. There was nobody there. And in, in 1989, I went to Shanghai. And Shanghai consists of the Shanghai municipality and then Pudong. There was nothing in Pudong across the Yampu River. And Nowadays, it's a city that is thriving and so forth. And the airport is further the, uh, east of Pudong. Anyway, you know, once you have capitalism and the free market and people can choose what they want to do, and once they can choose what they want, what they can buy, once they can choose what they can produce, and it's no longer in the hand of the government, economies thrive. And I mean, in America, everybody bitches about the Chinese, but the fact is no country has grown, admittedly from a low level, as fast as China over the last 30, 40 years, because Deng Xiaoping opened up the country to the market economy. Otherwise, they wouldn't be where they are. Right. You know, Mark, and I Russia think- the same. Russia has developed enormously. Russia. I went to a market in Russia in 1980. It was just before my my daughter was born, and there were people lining up, lines of people to buy rotten apples and rotten tomatoes. That was the situation in Russia, and in the hotel you could order caviar, and there are plenty of caviar. Uh, and you ordered a bottle of champagne that didn't have any ice. <laughs> so the people, the, how the people lived is so low, but that wasn't necessary because there were products. They were just available to the wealthy they, visitors. Well, the wealthy people, they always have a way to get things, you know, mm-hmm. either because Russia was very large. It stretched essentially from Kazakhstan, Azerbaijan, uh, all the way to uh, Vladivostok in the east and in the north, essentially, the North Pole. But uh, so the well-to-do people, they could obtain goods from the entire empire of the Soviet Union. and they could buy goods on the black market. 
in a socialist economy, you have always black markets and they become very powerful. But what I want to say is, you know, we have to be very careful that we don't move into uh, socialism and a totalitarian regime, which is easier to introduce under socialism than it is under a market economy. Because under a market economy, you have different actors. So you have Silicon Valley, they say produce high-tech uh, products and services. And then you have the steel industry and the aluminum industry. And then you have the financial industry in New York and so forth. So all these, they basically compete with each other to some extent, but they also uh, do business with each other. But there's no monopoly. Once you have an extreme socialist communist system, you have a monopoly, and that is the government. The government will tell you, Michel, we don't like your dress today. You better change your dress to a green dress. That is socialism. You know, this is But such the people, the young people don't realize right. that. Right. I've seen it. I've seen it. And I can tell, this is, I wrote recently a report. There are a few things I never expected in my life. One is negative interest rates. That I would have dreamt of. Number two, that in a modern society that is relatively educated, that we would have money printing the way we have it. So we have seen in history so many examples where money printing ends badly. And the third thing I said that I never expected is that after the disaster we have seen in Eastern Europe, in Russia, the Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, that young people would go and say they want more government and they want socialism. That I would never have expected. Mark, I want to um, say something here. This has to do with a complete lack of education, which I believe is manipulated um, to not inform people. If people in college realized the um, pattern you just laid out of the way socialism starts, what it leads into, and its ultimate result, that just the fact that you can only wear a red or green dress, <laughs> just that one fact, I guarantee you, would have the whole population of a college perk up and say, what? Tell us more. What, what does that mean? Because they have no idea of the reality of the situation. That's why I think this discussion is so important. Yes. I mean, I, I, I'm just writing about someone who, became, who came into the limelight about two years ago again. Uh, this is a Jewish refugee called Hannah Arndt. And she wrote, uh, you know, about totalitarianism. And she also became very famous of her description of the Eichmann trial. As you may recall, uh, Adolf Eichmann <laughs> was working for, for Heydrich, uh, and he was shipping Jewish people to Auschwitz, essentially, to exterminate them during the Second World War. But he was able to flee after the Second World War and disappear. But Mossad caught him then in 1960 in Buenos Aires. And he then stood trial and this Hannah Arndt, she was sent by the New Yorker to write a report because she had uh, experienced uh, captured by the Germans as well. But she was also able to flee. In any event, she described Eichmann in a kind of not too criminal way. And that caused a huge controversy in, uh, among intellectuals around the world. So she is very famous for this uh, book about totalitarianism and about this Eichmann trial, which was at that time a big thing. It was as big as Nuremberg because he was tried 
in Israel. And he said, well, I'm innocent in the sense that I only followed orders. Mm. And she described him as a very ordinary bureaucrat, someone rather dumb that just didn't question, doesn't question. the morality of the orders. Right. Does it stop and say why, who, what, where? Why are we yes. doing this? What does this really yes. mean? It seems like that is what's happening now too, Mark. <coughs> yeah, to some extent, yes. Yes, unfortunately. Why do you think that is? Do you think that people just want to be cool or do you think they're genuinely afraid to um, question what's going on? Because, like I said, you know, the socialism scenario your prediction of the fact that the United States could be completely socialistic within 10 years, I don't think that people realize how close, how serious this threat is and what it will lead to. It's a lot easier to have socialism come in than it's going to be to get rid of it. To get rid of it is practically impossible uh, unless you have a revolution or unless conditions get so bad that people are fed up with it. You know, things in Eastern Europe and in the Soviet Union and in China got so bad. And then they realized the other countries are so much better off. Deng Xiaoping, he woke up to the fact, Jesus, how can these countries do so well? And in China, we're so poor. And uh, I think he met relatively early on Lee Kuan Yew of Singapore. And Lee Kuan Yew explained to him that, you know, free markets and the capitalistic system are good. And Lee Kuan Yew was kind of a dictator, but a benevolent <laughs> dictator whose aim was to have a so-called controlled democracy. Mm. <laughs> but anyway, the, the thing is, it, it, I think... It, it will become bad, and I think for the prosperity of a country, it's going to be bad. But equally, I have to say this, I can understand that many Americans, and by the way, this is the same that led to some of the demonstrations in Hong Kong, and it's a global phenomenon. Because of money printing, you have to figure out, we print money. People who own paintings 30 years ago or 40 years ago, say start in 1980, or people who were rich and they had a stock portfolio, or people who had a home, or people who had apartment buildings or office buildings, as a result of this money printing, the value of all these assets have gone up dramatically. So uh, the Money printing makes people rich who already have assets. You know, I went to school and we, my, the school was for rich kids, except, except we were not rich. But my friend uh, is a very good friend. His family had one of the largest collection of Impressionist paintings, the Han Loser from family in Switzerland. They have a museum also in Bern. They had the Van Goghs in the toilets. You know, the, the valuable paintings everywhere. <laughs> and when we had parties, we used to throw glasses at the wall. <laughs> anyway, because the value of these paintings has gone from, say, a million, or maybe half a million, to 20, 30 million, he's never worked in his life. And he's become even richer. He just sold recently a building for $100 million on corner Bahnhofstrasse in Zurich. And so the asset inflation is a product of essentially money printing. Now, you've probably read that the millennials at 35 years of age earn less than their boomer parents at 35 years and they have much less money. This is a fact. This is not a socialist uh, view uh, by Berkeley University. This is a, a statistically established fact. The reason is simply that the young people 
you know, when I started to work in 1970, I could buy a treasury yielding 6%. In other words, the compounding effect at 6% makes you rich over, say, 50 years. But if interest rates are next to zero, how do you want to make any money? Right. You know, so the young people, they, I understand that they're not happy with the system. But despite of this understanding, I think they should consider that instead of socialism, there could be some measures in the capitalistic system that would reduce inequality. And one of these measures would be to stop printing money. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's the craziness. We have abused the capitalistic, well, not we. There are certain members of our society, meaning the Federal Reserve and the elite of our country, that have abused it to the point of making themselves very, very wealthy and then creating yes. this <laughs> very large mass of poor people who now want socialism, who unfortunately have no idea what it will lead to and don't question anything. That's what surprises me. I talk to people all the time that don't question things, Mark. They don't say why they don't. They don't want to oppose anything. They don't want to say, I don't agree, you know? Well, this is also something this Hannah Arndt wrote about, that a dumbed-down population who doesn't know anymore what is true and what is untrue. You know, this is, we have all these fake news. And so somebody at the end can't even form an opinion about something. And so they're more likely to follow a leader. So this is, a, in my view, a big issue for especially wealthy people in the long run. It may not happen overnight, but this is something they need to consider that uh, sooner or later, the tax man will come. <laughs> and I'm not saying this because I have any grudge against wealthy people. On the contrary, because of this money printing, I have become affluent. But I think as an economist, uh, it's gone too far. You know, I mean, I, I admire people who are smart and who are good at trading and buying and selling securities and so forth. But isn't it strange that some of the richest people in the world are hedge fund managers? You know, people that essentially never built anything. They never uh, invented anything. They never done anything else but except buying and selling stocks. There's something is wrong in the system. Yes, that that's is very the interesting, era. right? And so the original wealth of America was built by people who produced something, you know, Ford or Rockefeller or Carnegie, uh, Ingersoll and so forth. Uh, these were all people that essentially produced something and with their industrial production, improve the lifestyle of the population and improve productivity. But if someone buys and sells stocks, what is it going to do? Doesn't right. contribute much to society. But then they go and give to charity, which is good. But charities have also disadvantages. You know, it's a, it's a big issue. Uh, this charitable work and foundations, they can move <laughs> into politics and uh, kind of under the umbrella of being a, a NGO, they can influence people and uh, elections. Right. And if they are a politician like the Clintons, they have this, we have a huge <laughs> debacle. <laughs> yeah. They can become very rich. <laughs> yes, they can, and they did. <laughs> it's very interesting. Mark, um, I want to get into I, I really wanted to cover that, that topic of socialism because no one knows it like you as far as our guests go because you've been all around the world and you've seen so many things, and I think it's so important for people to start to open their eyes so that they can show 
people, you know what I mean, and tell people and start to introduce this to if, if our educational system isn't going to do it, our political system isn't going to do it, we've got to do it ourselves to show Americans each other but the result. You understand, the problem is, uh, when I talk to journalists, the media, and also to teachers, most of them are socialists already. <laughs> so how are they going to tell the children that socialism is bad? They're going to ex- tell the children, you know, they, they're going to bitch about rich people. This is the problem. I know quite that even in my family, I have family members that are socialists. Why? And then I distinguish between real socialists and like my brother, my late brother, he was a salon socialist, a living room socialist. He could <laughs> curse uh, the rich people uh, and how unfair the system is and so forth. And five minutes later, this was at my father's house, and five minutes later he would go water skiing with my father's motorboat. Exactly. And the you most... Know, this right. is the salon socialist. They... They lived a good life, but they broadcast. It's like Pelosi, she lives, to, she's rich, you know. <laughs> she will talk about socialism. She is a complete capitalist. I mean, the, <laughs> yes. the biggest capitalists in the country are the ones that talk about how socialists will be so great. I mean, we have, we have an entire industry built on complete capitalism in Hollywood. And, <laughs> I mean, they're complete capitalists. That's what they are. And yes. that they talk about and, you know, seem to lecture everyone on the um, benefits of socialism yeah, the very left. Fact, their industry is capitalism. That's yeah, of course. They're very left leaning. But as you say, Hollywood is essentially all about money. <laughs> they lecture the others about socialism. I want to um, get from your perspective the investments that stand to lose the most in this debt bubble. Where are the biggest dangers, Mark? Well, first of all, uh, I have to say that, um, yes, it is a debt bubble. But you understand, I would have said the same 10 years ago. And the debt bubble has just become bigger and bigger. And as a result of the lower and lower interest rates and the accumulation of debts on the balance sheet of central banks. So if you look at Japan... Their government debt is over 200% of GDP and they keep on buying assets. And, you know, you scratch your head and you think, how can this go on? But it's gone on for much longer than I thought. And everybody who's been shorting the yen and everybody who has been shorting JGBs, these are Japanese government bonds. In fact, all the hedge fund managers did that. It's been a graveyard for them financially. Because interest rates are still negative in Japan after more than six years. They haven't gone up. And the yen has remained a strong currency. So it's, uh, you know, we have a debt bubble, but equally we have to say it's wrong to just say it's a debt bubble and it's got to burst because we don't know when. And there are ways where this debt bubble could actually be deflated. Like some proposals are like a debt jubilee, like the student debts. You know, it's up from maybe less than a hundred billion dollars uh, 15 years ago to now 1.5 trillion. It's not sustainable, and most of the students don't have the money to pay either the interest on the debt or repay. So you could forgive that debt in in essence. But then you create a situation where the student who financed his studies working his ass off at night in a McDonald's or somewhere else, he will say, well, it's unfair. I worked and paid for my studies and this other guy, he just borrowed and now he's forgiven his debt. To this I would respond, 
Well, maybe it's unfair, but by working at night and working a lot, you proved that you are a hard worker, working person. And you, if you came to an interview and I asked you, how did you finance your studies? And you said that, I would say, I would rather hire him than someone who walks into my office and say, how did you finance your studies? And he said, oh, I borrowed money and then the government forgave the debt. Right. You understand? So I think that hard work in life is never entirely uh, wasted. Right. But it's basically, from a society point of view, it would be unfair to forgive that. And then the car owners would come and say, well, why do we forgive the debt of students? We borrow money for cars and we can't repay or the government will repossess our cars. We also want uh, debt forgiveness. And then Argentina will come and everybody will come and the homeowners and so forth. So then you can have a debt reset, you know, where essentially everything is written off. But then obviously the people who don't lend money, they will not suffer. But the asset holders say, I own bonds. I would be uh, suffering from that. Mm. <coughs> and all, but then there is another issue. The person who says, uh, it doesn't touch me because I have no bonds and I have no money. Uh, that may be wrong depending whether he works for a company that has a pension fund. Because if there is debt forgiveness and the pension fund owns a lot of bonds of institutions that will be forgiven, they will lose a lot of money. Then they have to go to the workers and say, well, we have to cut your benefits. And then you have like, again, strikes like in France, or uh, what happened in Argentina, because people don't want to have their benefits cut. It's politically very difficult to implement. So at the end, the government has to restart printing money. <laughs> <laughs> that same circle. Y yes, the it's same a complication. circle. It's a complicated situation, even if we yes. uh, get Jubilee. But this complicated uh, situation has been largely created by us. We wanted the Fed to essentially print money and to lower interest rates and so forth. And as you said, most people didn't think it through. When the Fed started with QE1 in December 2008, I immediately said, this is not QE1, this is QE infinity. Because mm -hmm. Once a government program starts, it will be very difficult to abandon that program. And I think we've moved into a direction where recently there has been these uh, problems in the repo market. The repo market is basically where banks uh, borrow from each other overnight. But there has been some tightness in liquidity there. And so the Fed has started, they don't call it QE, but in essence, in reality, it is QE. The balance sheet of the Fed is again expanding at the present time and very rapidly. So uh, I think they will never, they will ne not be able to abandon QE programs. Wow. Mark, I want you to talk to us about what the best assets are to hold right now in, uh, in your view with uh, what's happening worldwide. Well, uh, I think that Americans should consider to hold some assets outside of the U.S., uh, because of the dollar weakness I referred to earlier. I think if the dollar weakens, obviously, uh, you want to have some money outside the U.S. And in the U.S., the essentially large asset classes are real estate, bonds, stocks, commodities, precious metals, 
and art or collect collectibles. Everything has been inflated, but some things with the inflation in asset prices have lagged behind. So <coughs> if you look at the stock market, you have stocks that are by statistical methods very expensive, and then you have stocks that are depressed. Mm -hmm. Oil shares are very depressed because there is a fear in the marketplace that the environmentalists will sue the oil companies and the petrochemical industry the same way uh, some uh, people sued the tobacco industry. You know, and that could involve a lot of money. I don't think the government will let it happen, but at the present time, because we have a Trump and he's pro oil and gas, but in future, who knows? So that's why the valuation of oil is relatively low. And the oil servicing companies, in other words, Halliburton, Schlumberger, uh, Diamond Offshore, uh, Transocean, all, um, all these companies are also depressed. I think they offer some value, actually. Mm. And then you have the banks, relative to the market, have recently been strengthening, but they are by valuation measurements or uh, yes by valuation they are relatively inexpensive and then we can go if we go overseas relative to the u.s market european stocks are very inexpensive uh, relative to u.s stocks emerging markets are very inexpensive and uh, relative to u.s stocks commodities are also inexpensive particularly agricultural commodities but the problem for the individual is how do you invest in agricultural commodities so you have some companies that have own farms uh, and they are traders in grain so that's one way you can buy fertilizer companies or in theory you can buy a farm but I can tell you, farming is a very tough job. <laughs> it's unbelievably tough. <laughs> and uh, gradually, small farmers disappear. Mm -hmm. You know, the big companies are so powerful. Uh, the smaller farmers, and the small, by small farmers, I'd say, these are large farmers, but they're individual farmers. It's a profession that will disappear. The people are attending. Uh, the University of Southern California and Berkeley, do you think they want to go and work on a farm? <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm watching it happen. I'm from the Midwest, and the small farmers are just, they're yes, having a uh, really horrible. Time. I want to take a moment to mention to everybody to repeat our link because we have an extraordinary report that explores <laughs> Dr. Farber's deeper analysis, his financial risks, everything he's talking about right now. It's free. The link is at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Mark, M-A-R-C. So you get an opportunity to go further into the investments he's talking about and a lot of the things that he's speaking of. Mark, please tell everybody about your website and also, what exactly is the gloom, boom, doom report? Well, the website is uh, gloomboomdoom.com. I repeat, gloomboomdoom.com. And the report, uh, and what I've done in uh, my life as an investor and uh, in my professional life in the financial market is, Basically, I started to work in 1970 for White Weld, and then in 78, I opened the offices for Drexel Burnham in Asia, but I'd moved in 73 to Asia. And I always found that the research offered by banks and by Wall Street was a, a kind of 
uh, very consensus, you know, the market will go up and so forth. And I was always looking for unusual opportunities. And living in Asia, I found the opportunity in the sense that the first offices of Canadian, US, and Australian brokers in Hong Kong and Singapore and Tokyo was to get Asian money to invest in America. But having seen the rise of Japan in the 60s and 70s and seeing uh, the opening and the rise of South Korea, South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong were dirt poor in the early 70s, very poor. And so as I saw that they would develop, I thought it's not that we should do business uh, selling American securities to Asians, but Americans and Europeans should buy securities in Asian markets. And initially it was limited because only two markets were open to foreigners, or actually three, aside from Japan. It was Hong Kong, Singapore, Malaysia. But gradually, other markets opened up. And as you know, uh, in, in China, everything is always possible. <laughs> it's not always 100% legal, but it's possible. <laughs> so, anyway, I just started to essentially uh, research these markets and write reports about these markets. And so I create some kind of a reputation in emerging economies. And ever since I uh, tried to identify unusual investment opportunities around the world, both on the long side and the short side. Now the short side, I haven't done much work in the last uh, 20 years because I got burned in the late uh, 80s, uh, uh, sorry, late 90s just before the 2000 peak. This is a black spot in my career. But I said to myself, in a money printing environment, markets will go up, you know, when you print money. And yes, there are companies that will go out of business. My friend, uh, Jim Chanos, he identified Enron, uh, a company that eventually went bust and so forth. But <coughs> when the market, when the market goes up and when the market is healthy, say 70 to 80 percent of the shares go up. And equally in a bear market, when the market goes down, 80 percent of shares go down. So the probability that in a bear market you make money by buying shares is not very high. Some people have made money in the bear market, but not many. And in a bull market, if you're short, uh, you're missing an opportunity. And uh, most people who short in a bull market, they lose money. So in the last few years, I focused more on unusual opportunities, A, in commodities and in bonds and in emerging markets and in currencies, and less on shorting stuff. Mm. But I think, you know, maybe the time will come again where there are good shorts. Mark, you are amazing, and I know everyone can tell <laughs> your, your details know. on people and places My and wife countries doesn't and currencies. Think so. <laughs> <laughs> well, looking into the, your reports, and our special report is going to be nothing but advantageous. Now, before we go, your latest contribution on your website, I noticed, talked about humility. And especially at this time of the year, um, I want you to talk to us just a little bit about the most important qualities you learned while you were growing up and <laughs> who taught them to you, Mark? Well, I mean, my parents, uh, you have to see, I grew up after the Second World War and the Second World War Nothing much was destroyed in Switzerland because we stayed neutral 
So we ha- didn't experience the destruction uh, that uh, had occurred in Italy, France, and in the uh, Balkan countries, and especially in Germany, Austria. But nevertheless, it had also had a bearing on the population. And uh, we grew up in uh, in the 50s, in, even in Switzerland, very few people were rich. We had a middle class, but uh, like my grandfather, he was an engineer, just to show how the world changes. And uh, he had uh, one of the first TV sets in the city where he lived, in Baden. And it was a black and white TV that didn't work, that, uh, didn't work half the time. <laughs> and everybody cursed it because there was always uh, kind of interruptions. Uh, but it cost 2,000 US dollars in those days. Wow. Black and white, there were only two stations that you could watch. The German uh, station and the Swiss, they were both government stations. <coughs> and the environment we grew up was, you don't throw any food away. You eat what is on your plate and uh, if uh, they are, there is too much food that I was prepared by my grandparents or my parents or whatever it is. You put it in the fridge and then once a week you eat all the leftovers. And with the clothes, it was like this. I had an older brother. So a lot of clothes I inherited. <laughs> yes, after he was wearing it, I had to wear it <laughs> because... You know, we were, the society was not yet a consumption society, consumer society. Uh, saving was re- regarded as a virtue. And punctuality was regarded as a virtue and politeness and so forth and so on. So I grew up with all these things. And uh, to essentially... Uh, Try to help other people if you can. Not everybody is in that position. You see, I mean, in life, some people are not very fortunate and they're not in a position to even state their opinion. And some people are in a fortunate, more fortunate position so they can state their opinions and uh, they can also uh, try to do things to improve the lives of the people that are around them. I don't believe that we can improve the lives of everyone in the world, but say in your small world where you interact with neighbors and with uh, family and so forth, you can try to help if you can. And the other thing that I think is very important is to remain humble because, you know, you shouldn't become arrogant just because you've earned more money than someone else, because success in life cannot be measured in uh, money alone. And as I told you before, I'm Christian, and I'm not an extreme Christian, but I think it's important to to try to live as closely as uh, the Ten Commandments demand from us. Thank you so much for coming on the show today and Merry well, Christmas. You're today. most welcome, Michelle. Take care and I wish you Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And the same to your uh, viewers yes. and listeners. Bye bye. Bye bye.